כיוכלו להפנות גם לישראל. דייוויד, מה שאני רוצה להגיד, אני רוצה להשאיר לכם את הדילמה שלנו בנושא שלנו, זה שכאשר יש איזה נו וידאו שקורה, השאלה היא מה לעשות, צריך ללכת ולשאול את זה, כמובן, לא האטרוסטים, עד לפחות, אבל צריך ללכת ולשאול את זה פסיכולוגית של דאעש, או... In a way, by showing it, we are enhancing the threat. Do you, after all these years of experience, do you really feel this is a new kind of threat, something we haven't seen before, something which is really threatening the world order or the regional order, or it's because of their usage of the new media in this era, and in a way they're managing to confuse us, and they're bigger than what, they seem bigger than what they are? They're um, unusually adept in a... T- frightening way at, at using uh, media. I keep thinking that um, it's, it's, this approach is going to backfire for them. But it's obvious, even if 90% of the Muslim world looks at these images with revulsion, that may not be their target. They may be going after the 10% who's seeing this You know, the romance, the adventure, the defiance, the, you know, uh, solidarity of this uh, hyper-violent jihad. I will hold the panel out in English. We are here to talk about the next regional challenge. I have, uh, we have with us here Professor Joram Schweitz. He is the head of the... Terror and Low Intensity Fighting Program at the INNC. Mike Heller was a senior <coughs> scholar at the um, Institute and also uh, and Karmit Valenci, who is, a doc- is doing her doctorate in uh, Tel Aviv University on terror uh, organizations as uh, hybrid organizations, and David Ignatius. journalist uh, around and always a very good source of information to know what's going on in our region and around the world. So thank you for being with us. Mm. The truth is that the question regarding the next great threat should have an asterisk next to it because all of us, all the experts and everyone who lives here didn't know in two, that we would be sitting here in 215 and talk to talk about this threat that there isn't anyone in the world hasn't heard about or seen what it does to the extent that it has become part of our uh, election campaign and we saw a clip uh, that the prime minister released on Saturday night with people with dash flags with ISIS flags coming all the way to Jerusalem so this is really an amazing branding from a very unknown completely unknown factor to a star in the Israeli uh, election campaigns. Clearly, this is the most spoken about issue in the Middle East. (laughs) I guess they heard about us, too, over there. (laughs) They stopped in Tel Aviv, but if we don't do what they say in uh, the uh, elections, they'll get to Jerusalem. They'll get to Jerusalem. They took the wrong turn. So some people say that this story of ISIS, uh, we heard from Dennis Ross in the previous uh, panel, that it changes alliances and strategies and that my enemy becomes momentarily my uh, ally. It appeared to the West that after decades of interstate discourses with regimes that one could somehow speak in a common language. There's now a vacuum in this region into which an organization has, which has proved that it has no red lines, has entered, and it is using, it's using the new media to cast terror, not only over the region, but in Europe as well. And we're trying to understand if this threat is indeed so significant, and two, whether the West is play is fighting this threat with the weapons of yesterday and three if there are successes on the ground will this indeed resolve the problem of an ideology which is gaining momentum across the sea in Europe and perhaps later in the US too so I know that you have prepared presentations but we're very short in time so we have to be flexible 
if uh, if you can. So I'd like to ask you each very, very briefly before we start the discussion. It's true that we fell asleep on the job, that we were unable to identify this a threat in time. What is the lesson as people who are observing what's happening in this region? Uh, what is the lesson? It's a one-liner. You give a very brief answer. I don't agree that we fell asleep on the job. I uh, think that we, some of us anyway, were quite aware of the possibility that this entire phenomenon that was called mistakenly, of course, the Arab Spring could uh, develop in directions that include the dismantlement of state frameworks in theory, in fact, if not in theory, and, and the growth of extreme radical Islamic movements. And therefore, those who are completely surprised by the appearance of ISIS uh, in this area after Al-Qaeda and Jabhat al-Nusra had been active for so long shouldn't have been surprised. David, which brings me to, to I, I wanted to share with you a dilemma we have in our newsroom is whenever there is a, vi a new video coming out, the question is what to do. Should we go along and show it, with, and of course not the atrocities up to a point, but should we go along with this psychological warfare of Daesh, or in a way by showing it, we're enhancing the threat. Do you, after all these years of experience, do you really feel this is a new kind of threat, something we haven't seen before, something which is really threatening the world order or the regional order, or it's because of their usage of the new media in this era, and in a way they're managing to confuse us, and they're bigger than what, it, they seem bigger than what they are. They're um, unusually adept in a t frightening way at, at using uh, media. I keep thinking that um, it's, it's, this approach is going to backfire for them, but it's obvious even if 90% of the Muslim world looks at these images with revulsion, that may not be their target. They may be going after the 10% who's seeing this, you know, the romance, the adventure, the defiance, the, you know, a solidarity of this uh, hyper-violent jihad. Um, and that's something that, I sometimes wonder if this may be closer to uh, a criminal gang than a, than a religious movement. Um, and it recruits the way, the way criminal gangs do. And if that's so, you need to think about it uh, a, a, little bit, a little bit differently. In terms of the staying power of... Could you say just something more about thinking differently? What would you do differently? What would you do differently thinking? Because that's a really interesting way of so, thought. So I haven't the, heard of it The simple before. answer to your question is, uh, I think, in the, in the media... Nakat Pula Effectivit. Professor Schweitzer, is it true that the way that the, EU, the West and the United States is running the campaign is the best way, or are they fighting the previous war? First of all, I'm not a professor. And second of all... I'll relate to the previous question and then to this one. The surprise is because they surprised themselves, too. ISIS is a phenomenon, and this phenomenon is a mutation in the global jihad camp. It exploited opportunities that occurred. Suddenly, the organization controlled territories, and it introduced content into the name Islamic State of Iraq because that was not the intention from the outset? No, there was a conflict in the global jihadist camp and they were driven out and they uh, declared themselves the Khalif, which is a very exceptional step in these movements and decided to carve out a state in an, a territory where the regimes didn't have the energy to fight against them and therefore this Mutation is a surprise, as well as the strategy that they are using, which I'm sure we'll talking about. As for the West, I'll say just one thing because I heard on the first evening here a small uh, confrontation between a, a, a professor and uh, his Brook and uh, David Petraeus. 
and uh, he said, uh, the professor said that it was a complete surprise and nobody foresaw it. And Petraeus said, David said that the signs were there. Uh, and the West, I heard, is talking about three to five years to contend with the phenomenon. We don't have that time because of the nature of the phenomenon and its spirit. What does that mean? If it takes five years, uh, there, it's discussed in terms of terror. Terror is a word that everybody uses. The phenomenon of ISIS is much worse, much more serious. We're talking about a, a doctrine of the Robespierre and a doctrine combined with Al-Qaeda, which which uh, 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 cha completely challenges the values of the Western world. This is much worse than a terrorist event. So you're saying we need to, it needs to be dealt with fast and not in time. Kamit, you offer a broader perspective than the way we look at ISIS through their horror clips and the beheadings and burnings and so on, that we have to look at the civil aspects of what they are doing on the sound, which gives them more points than we can understand. Yes, as you mentioned, the Islamic State, we have become uh, uh, accustomed to looking at through these horror clips of the beheadings and the recent burning. There is another uh, aspect that we should focus on. And uh, there, uh, we should look at the, uh, there is the focus on the military aspect, but there is a uh, fascinating dimension from a scholarly point of view and empirically of what's happening in Iraq and Syria. There is a significant establishment of an organization that is developing uh, characteristics and features of a state. That's something we didn't see in uh, Al-Qaeda Iraq. This is not typical of Al-Qaeda, these social, political, civilian, civil aspects. And if we put this in within the chaotic context of the Middle East and the dysfunctionality of the uh, um, uh, regimes, they provide a their, their, their inability to provide basic services, and ISIS steps in and starts giving services and enables the population to live an almost normal life, whether we're talking about the establishment of courts, new education systems. ISIS completely undermined the previous systems, but uh, it's this isn't like Shas in Israel that uh, is helping the masses and is honoring the rules of the game. ISIS comes along and say, these are the rules of the game, and if you don't agree with those very strict rules, then you pay with your head. Yes, there are three dimensions that ISIS is, is the juggling. One is the conceptual ideological aspect. People who follow this organization, there are those who believe in this organization because they believe that it offers a real alternative. And this uh, may be typical of the lack of identity of this period in time. And there's also the material aspect, as I mentioned, the provision of services. And there is also the violent, coercive aspect. And there is a tension between the image of this violent organization and this welfare organization that is working to aid the population. ISIS is also contending with this tension, and the population doesn't always know how to digest this um, uh, uh, contrast between the images, but it gives them a great deal of power as they act on these three levels. And on the other hand, it's also problematic and can be an obstacle in the eyes of the organization because it's difficult to be both this frightening, horrifying, uh, um, a violent organization and also to provide welfare uh, services. But this brings me back to you, Mark. Clearly, and this is already a given, the collapse of the state frameworks, that vacuum is what enabled the growth of this organization. Mark, I think what you want to say is that we need a perspective in this subject too, at least as our feeling is, is concerned, especially for those who live in Israel, regarding that this collapse creates chaos which cannot be good for us. Okay, do you want to see the presentation? If you could just do this very briefly, because otherwise 
It's four slides, so it's okay. But really, just to illustrate your point. And again, I apologize. I will try to keep track of time. Okay. Okay, how do I uh, now play the video? Okay, never mind. It's a shame because it's quite amusing. Yes, you're right. Please come back to us. What I meant to say very briefly is that, first of all, this uh, phenomenon of uh, countries uh, disintegrating and all sorts of changes of borders and so forth uh, have to do with this atrocious phenomenon of an ice of ISIS or Islamic State or whatever you like to call it, and it's very horrifying. It's, uh, it's scary because of the association of this. Uh, barbarian way of conduct that ISIS has adopted, but also it's a fear of the unknown or the uh, something that you're not uh, familiar with. And you usually assume that when you know something, when you're familiar with something, it's more comforting. But the truth is that changes in boundaries and borders and changes in a, a organization, the, struct, the organizational structure of a, of a state is nothing new. It's something that happens uh, throughout history, not only in the Middle East, but in the entire world. It's a shame I had a short video of 100 years of border changes in Europe, 30-second video with uh, music, of course, very amusing. It's such a shame that it didn't work out. But either way, Pierre Lelouch this morning mentioned, and quite rightly so, that as if everyone is so uh, busy with the collapse of the Sykes-Picot regime, and we forget that over the last 100 years, there have been several changes of boundaries and borders and threats on borders, and we saw quite justly in the past the efforts made either through uh, uh, merging uh, countries or putting them apart, and we looked at Abdul Nasser's efforts to try to annihilate all sorts of countries. Yes, but there is one big difference, because the changes that took place here were always superpowers who divided the power between them. And now, for the first time in many years, the changes are taking place in the region without any boots on the ground of the Ottoman Empire or the French or the British. This region was left to fight for, its, uh, for itself. Well, it's not exactly accurate. Factually, the establishment of the Ar United Arab community were not, was not done with the intervention of good big superpowers. Uh, and the same is true uh, for Yemen. It's true that the Americans prevented the border changes between Iraq and Kuwait. But it's not exactly true. Either way, uh, the point is that not only is it nothing new, but I believe that we shouldn't really be too scared about it, because although the threat of the unknown is in place, it also presents opportunities, especially for Israel. And by this, I mean the opportunity of increasing the number of players in the various regional settings, and thereby increased flexibility in the regional settings and the diplomatic game, and establishing partnerships or alliances like we saw between Israel and Jordan, and how we see the uh, peace agreement with Egypt that allows uh, balance of powers in Sinai in order to fight the forces. Yes, and the conclusion I draw from this is that in certain cases, depending on the circumstances, of course, something has to guide the Israeli approach to these phenomena, and that is the desire to increase flexibility in the regional system in order to maximize partnership opportunities. And unfortunately, as we saw in the local elections, 
we don't have natural partners because we don't have partnership in identity or in value, but there are meeting points of interests, and the more players there are, the more opportunities there are. David, David, which brings me to, to I, I wanted to share with you a dilemma we have in our newsroom, is whenever there is a, vi a new video coming out, the question is what to do, should we go along and show it, with, and on, of course not the atrocities up to a point, but should we go along with this psychological warfare of Daesh, or in a way by showing it we're enhancing the threat. Do you, after all these years of experience, do you really feel this is a new kind of threat, something we haven't seen before, something which is really threatening the world order or the regional order, or it's because of their usage of the new media and this era, and in a way they're managing to confuse us, and they're bigger than what, it, they seem bigger than what they are. They're um, unusually adept in a t frightening way at, at using uh, media. I keep thinking that um, it's, it's, this approach is going to backfire for them, but it's obvious even if 90% of the Muslim world looks at these images with revulsion, that may not be their target. They may be going after the 10% who see in this, you know, the romance, the adventure, the defiance, the, you know, a solidarity of this uh, hyper-violent jihad. Um, and that's something that, I sometimes wonder if this may be closer to uh, a criminal gang than a, than a religious movement. Um, and it recruits the way, the way criminal gangs do. And if that's so, you need to think about it uh, a, a, little bit, a little bit differently. In terms of the staying power of... Could you say just something more about thinking differently? What would you do differently? What would you do differently thinking? Because that's a really interesting way of so, thought. So I haven't the, heard of it. The simple before. answer to your question is, uh, I think in the, in the media, our business is to share information with people, um, you know, taking out the parts that just shouldn't be seen. Um, but you know we shouldn't censor it because if you know we don't want people to yeah. glor to glorify the image. The, the question that I really am struggling with, and I I'd ask the audience to to to, th to think about, is whether uh, ISIS is burning so hot that it's going to burn itself out, or whether it's just going to keep uh, expanding. And I honestly uh, d don't know the answer to that. What, to, talking to people who were monitoring communications of ISIS fighters. Um, in, in, in Mosul and other areas, you hear some fascinating things. I, I was told that uh, if you want to leave Mosul today, you have to designate somebody who is your hostage because they're so paranoid that you'll leave and give information. Yoram. Can you perhaps phrase or draft from the ISIS point of view, from their perspective, who have surprisingly gained power? Where is it going? If you were to try and look ahead, are they thinking ahead? For instance, now the fact that suddenly Egypt is uh, acting against those uh, in Libya and so forth. Uh, how is it that they have so much impact on the geopolitics? Do they know what to do in the future? Well, it seems to be simple. That's what they're saying, and obviously ISIS is, part, is uh, uh, paving the way to an empire. That's their desire, that's what they want to do. And if you look at its uh, policy, even though it seems like a delusional uh, policy, al-Baghdadi's uh, policy, he's a gambler, he's ga gambling. And the fact that he has managed to adopt the strategy and has managed to provoke these countries and is uh, beheading its people, both in the Arab countries and in the West, he's doing it now to the Egyptians in Libya, and he has attempted to do this after his the attempted assassination failed. He is uh, uh, reminding me of Cassius Clay. He is trying to lure them in because he thinks that if Western forces intervene and interfere and there will be boots on the ground, he will be uh, seen as a defender of Islam. They will not be able to be strong enough to get rid of him and that will only help him have more people on his side. Just like uh, announcing he
he is a khalif is an attempt to create a, a religious framework for people to be attracted to this organization well in western eyes if you kill the head of the snake as we like to say if you kill the head of the snake then you hurt the entire organization like that's what they say in israel in his perspective by trying to hurt him we are in fact helping him well maybe he doesn't say that istishad is his uh, actual principle he doesn't actually want to die uh, but it's a problematic question because uh, all in all, uh, the fact that he announced himself as a khalif is not something that could, that uh, should be uh, jeered at because uh, he's a mutation. He's not something uh, normal in this uh, uh, history of Islam after Muhammad. And I think that if you try to uh, to take him down, then it will be very difficult, uh, it will be a bit pretentious. And quite clearly this organization, this state, in fact it's not an organization, it's a state, Islamic state. It will continue to um, act uh, on its principles. I don't think it will survive uh, long term, but the damage until then, and that's why this trend is not just terrorism, which is a spoiler by nature. This is a challenge uh, that will have to be dealt with, and I think that the bad smell from this corpse will continue for a long time. So what needs to happen for it to not survive? My professional instinct. But first of all, you have to look for it. The only question is it's a matter of time. The same was true for bin Laden. I'm not talking about al-Baghdadi, I'm talking about the entire organization. Well, I heard yesterday talk, when people talk about figures and terrorism and in this trend, because people keep saying, as you said, I, wa I wish I had money as much as I had uh, these, uh, as much as I hear different things. I mean, people are talking about 10,000, but they're moving all the time and people don't really know. The time it'll take to deal with it, they said three to five years, that's what they're saying. Now that's the biggest... Uh, uh, opinion. And this has to be dealt with because this really is a, a phenomenon. He is bringing in norms uh, behind which we have Al-Qaeda and uh, Islamic Jihad and uh, World Jihad and they will continue to work in his uh, uh, in his uh, spirit and uh, very uh, organizations that uh, we uh, don't like too much are a part of this and after uh, I don't know if they can be defeated but I think they're going to stay around for long Kamit, when you look at the way that they have managed to recruit and mobilize people ISIS, uh, people from the west and people from the ground. Is there any indication that you have found as to its hold on the ground, and whether it's a sympathy or whether it's fear? That's a very interesting question. It's difficult to estimate, estimate the scope of support for ISIS, especially in the areas where it controls uh, in Syria and Iraq. No polls have been carried out that uh, can measure, well, they're not answering the cellular phones. Uh, I would place a big question mark on the reliability of such polls if they were to be carried out, but we do see certain acceptance of ISIS presence in these areas and uh, some sympathy. For instance, in Raqqa, in Syria, we see that it's become a, a place uh, of support for ISIS, whether it's belief in the actual organization or the sense that ISIS is providing them with what they need. And how much of the population that is being occupied and controlled by ISIS actually mobilize and are uh, fighting for them as well? Yeah, well, there are no um, indications of that. Uh, in some areas, we see more mo mobili mo mobilization to the organization. ISIS is also integrating people in its administration and its administrative uh, part uh, to strengthen its governance. In Iraq, we see less uh, support. Uh, than in Syria, but it's very difficult to estimate and evaluate this phenomenon. Until now, we haven't seen much objection to it. At the beginning, in the early stages of the occupation by ISIS, there were attempts to object uh, and rally against their presence, and we all know what happens at the end of these protests, so right now it's a silent protest, if any. Mark, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there is yet another substantial change and development, and that is that against uh, bin Laden's and al-Qaeda's terrorism, it was clear that the moderate Arab states will object, but they won't be active players. But here against ISIS, there is a very clear game with Jordan and Egypt and Iran. 
Muslims who are fighting against this phenomenon. How significant is that? Please speak the microphone. Well, even if you were wrong, I wouldn't correct you. The fact that you're nice to journalists is really refreshing. Usually you want to bash the journalist. Well, I didn't go into politics and therefore I don't like to attack the media. I think that it would be right to say that until recently at least, the approach adopted by most countries Sunni countries, or those populated by a Sunni majority, uh, adopted a uh, uh, sort of uh, ambiguous uh, approach to this organization. And I want to reiterate what Dennis Ross said in the previous session. It's called, of course, Islamic State. But we must remind that it's already the second Islamic State. The first was established in Tehran in 1979. So this is the second Islamic state in Raqqa. And as for the uh, narrow viewpoint of myself as an Israeli, I don't care who wa if uh, the person who wants me to die is a Sunni or uh, someone who is a secular or whoever, what kind of uh, extremist it is. I can understand uh, the fear and anxiety because of uh, the uh, horror films, the horror videos that they are publishing uh, quite skillfully. But to go back to this matter of ISIS, in certain aspects, ISIS has taken upon itself to represent the Sunni identity in this expanse, in this arena, and especially in areas where Sunni populations have felt, uh, justly or unjustly, uh, that they are oppressed by non-Sunni regimes. And therefore, at first, it wasn't too difficult for Sunnis in certain areas to identify and sympathize with uh, these uh, people, their cousins, until it knocked on their door. And even when it knocked on their door, quite a few people, not on the governmental level, but in the private sector, that are still donating quite a lot, especially in the Gulf and in the uh, uh, peninsula, uh, they give of their money and energy and their insight uh, to this uh, Sunni campaign, so to speak. So yes, you're right. Once it became, in certain situations, a two-blade uh, sword, it's like in Egypt, for instance, when we saw the people on the streets in the Sinai Peninsula swearing to al maqdis then the Egyptian administration and the Egyptian population are starting to view this phenomenon quite differently. And the same is true for Jordan, of course. But this has to do with the extent to which this uh, phenomenon is becoming a threat to them directly and has nothing to do with sympathy for others. I, I want to... Uh David, which brings me to, to I, I wanted to share with you a dilemma we have in our newsroom is whenever there is a, vi a new video coming out, the question is what to do. Should we go along and show it? With, and on, of course, not the atrocities up to a point, but should we go along with this psychological warfare of Daesh or in a way by showing it, we're enhancing the threat. Do you, after all these years of experience, do you really feel this is a new kind of threat, something we haven't seen before, something which is really threatening the world order or the regional order, or it's because of their usage of the new media in this era, and in a way they're managing to confuse us, and they're bigger than what, it, they seem bigger than what they are. They're um, unusually adept in a, frightening way at, at using uh, media. I keep thinking that um, it's, it's, this approach is going to backfire for them. But it's obvious, even if 90% of the Muslim world looks at 
these images with revulsion, that may not be their target. They may be going after the 10% who see in this, you know, the romance, the adventure, the defiance, the, you know, a solidarity of this uh, hyper-violent jihad. Um, and that's something that I sometimes wonder if this may be closer to uh, a criminal gang than a, than a religious movement. Um, and it recruits the way, the way criminal gangs do. And if that's so, you need to think about it a, 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 little bit, a little bit differently. In terms of the staying power of... Could you say just something more about thinking differently? What would you do differently? What would you do differently thinking? Because that's a really interesting way of so, thought. So I haven't the, heard of it The simple before. answer to your question is, uh, I think in the, in the media, our business is to share information with people, um, you know, taking out the parts that just shouldn't be seen. Um, but, you know, we shouldn't censor it because if, you know, we don't want people to, yeah. glor to glorify the image. The, the question that I really am struggling with, and I, I'd ask the audience to, 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 th to think about, is whether uh, ISIS is burning so hot that it's going to burn itself out, or whether it's just going to keep uh, expanding. And I honestly uh, d don't know the answer to that. What, to, talking to people who were monitoring communications of ISIS fighters, um, in, in, in Mosul and other areas, you hear some fascinating things. I, I was told that uh, if you want to leave Mosul today, you have to designate somebody who is your hostage because they're so paranoid that you'll leave and give information and won't come back. So if you don't come back, that person, it's said, is, is killed. I mean, that kind of approach uh, is not a way to build support among the population. I mean, yes, it's, it's true, as you said, that they've learned from Hezbollah, in a sense, about the social service side of, of what they do. But, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd be amazed if people in these ISIS-controlled areas, you know, wanted to remain there voluntarily. And the best, just a final thought, the best uh, message to communicate may be the one from people who went off to join the jihad and saw this and were appalled. And there are a lot of them now. There are you know, many dozens who've come back to Saudi Arabia, uh, Britain, France, you know, having seen this and been horrified. And their uh, testimony about what they saw, if it can be projected, I think would be very powerful. Mark, you wanted to I'll give you the you wanted you, to you're up about the Israeli element of Israel's strategy of, uh, towards ISIS, because thankfully we're not the top priority of ISIS as far as this uh, the present is concerned. But you say it's just a matter of time, don't worry, they'll come to us and they will make us a target. Well, first of all, we already saw the proof, we already saw the jeeps on the way to Jerusalem in that video. You have to uh, understand very clearly, first of all, that ISIS and Al-Qaeda are all from the same material, they're all the same kind, it's the same ideology, just a different way of action. They said we're coming to the Golan because I want to be uh, on the way to you, I just want to finish with Assad first. The same is true for ISIS. Islamic State said that Israel is part of its ideological, rhetorical, uh, rhetorical um, priority, uh, like he said after the uh, attempted assassination, he said that he's a crusader. So, in terms of the practice, there are many enemies, and in terms of its priorities, Al Baghdadi's priorities. Uh, so we're not at the top of the list, but I would like to look Jabhat al Nusra and Al Qaeda, who are coming a little closer to us, because they are much more of a concrete threat. But they're also too busy with Assad at the moment. And at the same time, we are already seeing the first seeds of, the f of what will probably be, because I'm talking cautiously about the future terrorism that will go around the West. We see already in Europe concrete activity of those who are sympathizing, identifying with ISIS. Some have identified with Hijaz, with Al-Qaeda, but it's already there. In terms of Israel, this is already taking place. It will probably increase because we haven't yet seen the spillover from Syria to uh, the Middle East to Israel to uh, the United States. You believe that it is possible that they are preparing for a ISIS 9-11? Is that uh, a goal that they are striving for in terms of their impact, in terms of their attempt? Is that what they are seeing? 
Well, it seems right now that they're focusing on targets in the area, and they're not going out to international terrorism and at this scale, but perhaps due to Western attacks and strikes, if things go downwards, they will encourage or they will perhaps even tell rivals like Al-Qaeda to do something uh, impressive. Uh, that is something that is on the table, and we shouldn't be, uh, we should make sure that we know that the current uh, hit, so to speak, of terrorism is Abu Musa bel Suris, who said, uh, who said there are difficulties in a new 9 11, and he said all the Muslims, whoever has faith, then should do it themselves. And now we see how ISIS is really doing that. So the danger definitely is there. Karmic. The use of new media, the use that deeper understanding of this new media age, is it possible at all that if not for the new media, this would have been just yet another one of many different threats? Terror is not new. Barbarism is not new. Certainly not in the prism of history. The at first, they said there are some 30,000 uh, nuts running around here. Until they behead a Western citizen, nobody will do anything. Is the threat magnified because they're able to, we're able to see them in our living rooms and they come into our houses and into our lives? Yes. I, uh, ISIS has placed a very great emphasis on the war over the hearts and minds. It has a well-oiled a machine and everything is timed and planned and programmed and screened when they want to and is sending the messages that they want to send. It certainly intensifies the buzz that is created around them. It should be taken with proportion or in proportion. We're familiar of other organizations with similar characteristics. Yes, the intensity of the use of the media, the um, social networks that is something that lies at the core of this organization. It has a journal, a magazine, quite well known, that's translated into English. It's called The Big. And there you can see what's on the ISIS's timetable. And if we go back to Israel, it may be consoling to know that Israel is not currently at the focus of the organization. And there's been very little mention of Jews or the uh, of Israel, and only recently did they start talking concretely about Israel. Ultimately, we're talking about a pragmatic organization. The fact that it is fundamentalist and with a uh, one-dimensional uh, philosophy, but they will seek out were the timing right and it suited their uh, aims, we could very well find ourselves in the crosshides here. David, which brings me to, to I, I wanted to share with you a dilemma we have in our newsroom is whenever there is a, vi a new video coming out, the question is what to do. Should we go along and show it? With, and of course, not the atrocities up to a point, but should we go along with this psychological warfare of Daesh or in a way, by showing it, we're enhancing the threat. Do you, after all these years of experience, do you really feel this is a new kind of threat, something we haven't seen before, something which is really threatening the world order or the regional order, or it's because of their usage of the new media and this era, and in a way they're managing to confuse us, and they're bigger than what, it, they seem bigger than what they are? They're um, unusually adept in a, frightening way at, at using uh, media. I keep thinking that um, it's, it's, this approach is going to backfire for them. But it's obvious, even if 90% of the Muslim world looks at these images with revulsion, that may not be their target. They may be going after the 10% who see in this you know, the romance, the adventure, the defiance, the, you know, uh, solidarity of this uh, hyper-violent jihad. 
Um, and that's something that I sometimes wonder if this may be closer to uh, a criminal gang than a, than a religious movement. Um, and it recruits the way, the way criminal gangs do. And if that's so, you need to think about it uh, a, a, little bit, a little bit differently. In terms of the staying power of... Could you say just something more about thinking differently? What would you do differently? What would you do differently thinking? Because that's a really interesting way of so, thought. So I haven't the, heard of it. The simple before. answer to your question is, that, uh, I think in the, in the media, our business is to share information with people, um, you know, taking out the parts that just shouldn't be seen. Um, but, you know, we shouldn't censor it because if, you know, we don't want people to, yeah. glor to glorify the image. The, the question that I really am struggling with, and I, I'd ask the audience to, 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 th to think about, is whether uh, ISIS is burning so hot that it's going to burn itself out, or whether it's just going to keep uh, expanding. And I honestly uh, d don't know the answer to that. What, to, talking to people who were monitoring communications of ISIS fighters, um, in, in, in Mosul and other areas, you hear some fascinating things. I, I was told that uh, if you want to leave Mosul today, you have to designate somebody who is your hostage because they're so paranoid that you'll leave and give information and won't come back. So if you don't come back, that person, it's said, is, is killed. I mean, that kind of approach uh, is not a way to build support among the population. I mean, yes, it's, it's true, as you said, that they've learned from Hezbollah, in a sense, about the social service side of, of what they do. But, um, you know, I, I'd be amazed if people in these ISIS-controlled areas, you know, wanted to remain there voluntarily. And the best, just a final thought, the best uh, message to communicate may be the one from people who went off to join the jihad and saw this and were appalled. And there are a lot of them now. There are you know, many dozens who've come back to Saudi Arabia, uh, Britain, France, you know, having seen this and been horrified. And their uh, testimony about what they saw, if it can be projected, I think would be very powerful. Mark, you wanted to... I'll give you the you want to just a brief comment about what David said that the propaganda is aimed at the 10% minority I'd like to remind you that 10% minority is 150 million people I think we have to sum up and I think we can promise ourselves that in next year's conference of INSS, we'll be talking about ISIS again. I don't think they're going to disappear by then. You can view yourself as being invited to this panel next year. And then I hope you will have time to show your presentations. Good day to all of you.